Hi, welcome back. In this, the second of my 2017 data updates, I'd, I'd like to take a look at the US markets in 2016. Now, if there's a word that I would use to describe US markets in 2016, it would be resilient. Why resilient? At the start of the year, there were two very big concerns. The first was, and this was an ongoing concern, that the Fed would step back from quantitative easing and interest rates would go up. The second was that the slowdown you saw in the Chinese economy in the previous year would continue into 2017. Well, the start of the year didn't look that good. January 2016 was a very bad month. In fact, stocks were down 5%, making it one of the worst Januaries in U.S. market history. During the year, the Fed did decide to tighten up. And you saw this especially towards the end of the year when the Fed funds rate went up. The Chinese economy did not collapse, but did not pick up either. So global growth was pretty anemic. And on top of this, you had two big political crises. The first was UK voters deciding that the UK should exit the EU and Brexit. And the second was US voters electing Donald Trump as president, something that most voters and investors had not expected. You think with all these surprises, it would be a bad year for markets, right? In fact, it was a pretty good year. If you look on a month-by-month -month basis at, at the S&P 500 large cap stocks, the S&P 600 small cap stocks, and the T-bond rate, here's what we see. Large cap stocks had a good year. 11.74% was the return over the course of the year, including dividends. Small cap stocks had a great year. Their returns were more than 26%. T-bonds had a pretty anemic year. Why? Because as T-bond rates rose, the price of the bond suffered. And you saw that basically, if you invest in T-bonds, you made close to nothing over the course of the year. Now, how does this measure up to history? I added the 2016 data to the data that I already have on an annual basis going back, going back all the way to 1928. And if you look at the table in the top of this page, you'll actually see the average annual returns on stocks, T-bills, and T-bonds going back in history. I've looked at three slices of history, all the way back to 1928, the last 50 years and the last 10 years. I've computed two kinds of averages, arithmetic averages and geometric averages. What's the difference? With an arithmetic average, I just add up 50 numbers and divide by 50 for a 50-year average. In a geometric average, I look at the compounded effect. Now, I've used these annual average risk re uh, returns to actually compute risk premiums. Why? Because when you do valuation, one of the numbers you often need to value a company is an equity risk premium, the number you expect stocks to deliver over and above something risk-free. A lot of analysts use historical data. They use a table like mine, and all they do is compare what you'd have made on average investing in stocks over a period to what you'd have made investing in T-bills or T-bonds over that same period. The historical risk premiums I get by looking at the historical data that I have is captured in the table below. And you see me estimate 12 different risk premiums that I can use potentially for the U.S. and call them all historical premiums. Those premiums range from 2.3% at the low end to almost 8% at the high end. And I would argue that every one of them is flawed. Why? Let's take the 1928 through 2016 history. That's a long history, right? 88 years of data. The average historical premium that stocks have earned over and above T-bonds over that period is 6.24%. That's pretty impressive, second decimal point. The standard error in that number is 2.26%, which means that the true premium, if I want to get a range on the number, could be as low as 1.5% or, or more than 10%, plus or minus two standard errors. Historical data is extraordinarily noisy. In addition, whenever you use historical premiums, you're assuming mean reversion, that things will revert back to the way they used to be. For about 20 years now, I've argued against historical risk premiums, and post-2008, I've become even more vehement in making my case against historical premiums. And people ask, what can I do instead? I offer them a forward-looking premium. What's a forward-looking premium? I take stocks as they're priced today. I take expected cash flows and I back out from stock prices what the expected return should be on stocks. So basically, here's what I did. At the start of 2017, the S&P 500 was at 2038.83. I took the cash flows from the prior 12 months, 108.67, and I assumed that they would grow at 5.54%. Why 5.54%? Because that's the growth rate that analysts looking at the S&P 500 are projecting as growth in earnings for the S&P 500. 
So I have what you paid for stocks, 2038.83. I have my expected cash flows going forward. And beyond the fifth year, I assume your cash flows will continue to grow, but at the risk-free rate, which I've assumed is a good proxy for the growth rate in the economy. I solve for your required rate of return. I come up with 8.14%. You think, what does that mean? If you bought stocks at the start of 2017, given those expected cash flows, you can expect to make 8.14% a year on stocks. You subtract the 2.45%, which is the risk-free rate, you come up with an implied equity risk premium of 5.69%. Now, there is one, one troubling component to the cash flows that I used here. Those cash flows at the start of 2017 were actually higher than earnings. Not sustainable in the long term, so I did do a modified version of the implied premium where I did assume that the payout, the portion of earnings that would be paid out as dividends and buybacks would decrease over time to a sustainable level. A sustainable level being one that can be maintained to get the growth rate that we're projecting. With this, my expected cash flows are lower, but I do exactly what I did on the previous page. I compute that rate of return that would make the present value of my cash flows equal to 2038.83. I come up with an expected return of 6.95%. In other words, that's a discount rate that makes the present value of my cash flows equal to the level of the index rate. Subtracting out the risk free rate, I come up with an implied equity risk premium of 4.5% with these more conservative cash flows. And you think, what do I do with this? Well, first, you can use it in your valuation as your equity risk premium for, for the U.S. today. Here's the second, though. If you're, if you're asking, is that, a, is that a number that I can be comfortable with? If you compare this to the implied equity risk premiums that you've seen in the U.S. going back to 1960, the average implied equity risk premium for the U.S. going back to 1960 is about 4%. So 4.5% premium is actually higher than the historic norm, which makes me feel a little more comfortable about where stocks are priced today. Now, if you, if you think about T-bond rates, so, which are at 2.45%, you have a different question, especially now that the Fed is starting to wake up. You're saying, where, where are rates going? I've long argued that the Fed actually is not the entity that sets long-term rates. The Fed might set Fed funds rate. It can influence long-term rates. But long-term rates are determined by fundamentals. And the two fundamentals that drive interest rates are expected inflation and expected real growth. In fact, this is a graph that I've updated every year for the last few years, where I take the T-bond rate and graph it against the sum of expected in, of the inflation rate for the year and real growth for the year. I call the sum of the inflation and the real growth rate my intrinsic T-bond rate. So as you can see through time, the actual T-bond rate and the intrinsic rate have moved together. In the last few years, you can see why rates have been low. It's not so much because the Fed has done quantitative easing, though that has had an influence. It's because you've had low inflation and low growth. At the start of 2017, you do have a, a potential breakout. The T-bond rate is at 2.45%. And if you look at the growth in inflation, that we had in 2016, the intrinsic rate is at 3.6%. That's much higher than the intrinsic rates for the last few years. So that might be a signal that you're going to see higher interest rates this year. The Fed, of course, will act like it's, it is the force that's making rates go up. But I have a feeling that this is coming from much more fundamental factors. So let's close the loop here by going back to a metric that a lot of people like to use to look at stocks, to ask the question, are stocks today high, no, too high or too low? That's the P-E ratio. In fact, in this graph, I take the P-E ratio for the S&P 500 and I graph out four versions of it. The first is the actual P-E, the, the, mar the market cap divided by the net income in the most recent 12 months. The second is a, no is a normalized P-E. What's a normalized P-E? I take the, the, the index today, and I divide by the average earnings over the last 10 years, arguing that they can go up and down. The third is a CAPE, which is basically an inflation-adjusted normalized P, where I take the earnings and adjust them for inflation. And the fourth is the Schiller P, where I use Schiller's actual numbers, which are slightly different from mine. As you can see, with all four measures of the P ratios, we're starting to see pretty high P ratios. High relative to what? high relative to history. Not as high as it was in the late 90s, but as high as it was in 2007. That, I'm sure, is going to concern some people. So let's take a look at how concerned we should be. So I'm going to do something that I tried a few months ago. 
If you think about buying stocks, you have to ask yourself, if I don't buy stocks, what would I buy instead? And if, let's say, you're sort of buying stocks, you bought T-bonds. There's a way to compute the P-E ratio for a T-bond. It's very simple. If your T-bond rate is 2.5%, your P-E for the bond is 40, 1 over the T-bond rate. So I compute two numbers here. I take the Schiller P-E and I compare it. The Schiller P-E is at 27, at the start of 2017. That's a historic high. But if you invert the T-bond rate of 2.45%, the T-bond P-E is more than 40. So at, at this point, to argue that stocks are expensive, you've got to ignore that bonds are also expensive. So relative to interest rates today, you can see why there is no panic to go sell stocks just because the P-E ratio is high. There's one final contradiction I want to explain. P-E ratios are at high levels, high relative to history. Equity risk premiums, though, the implied equity risk premiums that I computed seem to be okay. You're saying, how do I reconcile the two? Here's the best way I have of explaining how the two numbers can coexist. In this graph, I have the P-E ratio, and you can see how it's risen since 2009 as we've come out of the crisis. I've also computed a ratio of the market cap of the S&P 500 to the cash flows in the S&P 500, dividends plus buybacks. Take a look at that number for the last five years. It's been about 20 each year for the last five. In other words, what's sustaining stocks are high cash flows, dividends and buybacks, which are staying high in spite of the fact that earnings are not increasing. Now, of course, that might trouble people because you're saying, how are they going to continue to do that? And to me, the two biggest concerns going into the next year are going to be that interest rates, which are 2.45%, will start climbing enough that the T-bond PE actually comes down to a level where it's competitive with stocks. And the second is that the cash flows that have been sustaining stocks, dividends and buybacks, you're going to start to see pull, uh, some pullback. That said, though, there are two counter forces that might keep cash flows up. The first, of course, is that tax laws might change. In fact, there's a very high likelihood that tax laws will change. And if, if tax laws change to either low, lower corporate tax rates or change the way trap cash will be treated when it's brought back in the U.S., that's additional cash to be used in buybacks. The other is there might be a pickup in real growth. And if that happens, you're going to see earnings grow. So at, at the moment, if you look at stocks, they look expensive relative to history, but not expensive relative to interest rates today. Are there concerns going forward? Yes. But when are there no concerns about investing in equities? I think the start of 2017 looks very much like the start of 2016 in terms of stock and bond markets. So let's see what happens. Thank you very much for listening.